uh, to to review. You can download them right now using the link. Um, I think it was in the chat box. Just check over there. So with that, let me introduce our speaker, um, uh, Dr. Bernie Scalar. He has over 60 years of technical experience at the following companies, the public aviation, Hughes Aircraft, Benton Industry, and the Aerospace Corporation. So I think today we have a lot of folks from Aerospace Corporation. Uh, at Aerospace, he helped develop the NILSAT, NILSTAR satellite system and was a principal architect for EHF satellite data link standards. Currently, he is the director of advanced systems as Communication Engineering Services, a consulting company he founded in 1984. So he's taught uh, engineering courses at several places, including UCLA and uh, rival USC. Um, he served uh, as an external examiner at postgraduate studies at the University of Cape Town. And uh, he has published over 100 technical papers and received the 1984 Price Paper Award for his series on digital communications. And his, he's the author uh, of Digital Communications Fundamentals and Application, which is now in its third edition. So just published uh, the new edition just came out this year recently. And uh, his academic background includes uh, BS in math and science from University of Michigan and uh, MS from electrical engineering from Polytech Institute of Brooklyn and a PhD from UCLA. So with that, let's welcome uh, Dr. Scalar and we'll uh, make you the presenter so you can present your slides. Yeah, I, I did that. So Bernie, you should be able to see the share button now. Um, thank you for that nice introduction, Victor. It's a pleasure uh, to be here tonight and to uh, and to talk to people from all over the U.S. and and particularly on this um, magical subject uh, OFDM, which is is really is rich with uh, technology, and um, I'm going to be telling you about the ABCs or the fundamentals of um, OFDM, and I, I think I have a lot of information to convey. Uh, that's why it has to be, this is only part one, and so um, hopefully we'll get a big chunk of it in uh, tonight, and we'll finish up with other parts uh, uh, when we see where we are. Let's see, can I click a share button so that you can see the uh, slides I'm about to present? Well, here we go. Um, I can share. Uh, let's see if I do this correctly. Uh, I think this is the one I want to share. Here we go. Um, does everybody see the screen that um, uh, the slide that says ABCs of OFDM. Looks good. Yes. Mm -hmm. You do. Okay. I am going to make this full screen now. Um, let's see if I can uh, eliminate my own picture here. Can I get rid of it or diminish it? Okay. Now we get rid of it. Okay, make sure we got an arrow here, working for us. Okay, so there's a lot to talk about, the ABCs of OTM. And by the way, when we get finished, if things do not go smoothly enough for you to get your questions answered, uh, right here is my email address. You might note it, just bsklar at ieee.org, and I'd be glad to answer anybody's uh, questions. So. If I were to come up with another title, um, I'd say, uh, besides the ABCs, I could say, or how to battle those awful effects of multipath distortion. And the first slide you see here is, what is OFDM's main function? It is to manipulate orthogonal sinusoids. So notice here, I have this abstract of what we're gonna be talking about that saying that the main benefit of OFDM 
is its ability to cope with severe multipath channel conditions without needing complex equalization uh, filters. So let me again emphasize that the way it's going to do this, the magic is involved in the fact that OFDM's main function is to manipulate orthogonal sinusoids. It doesn't want to see any kind of a, a wave shape besides a sinusoid. Why is this useful? Because sinusoids are absolutely amazing. The steady state response of a multipath channel yields no distortion to a fixed frequency sinusoid. Let's say that a little bit more precisely. That is, a steady state sinusoid plus its channel induced echoes into any linear time invariant uh, system yields an undistorted sinusoid uh, at the output. Uh, in other words, a little picture here. Um, if you have a perfect sinusoid uh, and the channel does the following to it, it adds echoes and echoes and echoes before it finally comes into uh, some linear time invariant system, some Think of it as some filter. Uh, what you're going to get is the same frequency, a change in amplitude and or uh, phase, but it is an undistorted, that that shape is irrevocably a pure sinusoidal shape, change in amplitude and phase probably. No other waveform has this property, absolutely none. And notice, do you see why this is true? This is uh, true because uh, any other waveform uh, is comprised of at least two or more sinusoids at different frequencies. Uh, that's how we can po point to any arbitrary shape and know that it's got some span of frequencies that make it up. So any other shape besides the pure sinusoid has more than one frequency and each one of them will be changed uniquely uh, going through this linear time invariant uh, system. So therefore the shape of the composite will typically change, hence suffer distortion. So it is amazing that no other waveform has this property, a remarkable taken for granted property because sinusoids are amazing and that's why we love OFDM. Uh, I wanna give you a warning before we go on that my presentation can be hazardous to your well-being. You are about to experience my quirks. I waste no paper. My slides are very busy and they're cluttered. Um, it didn't start off that way. They come, they start off nice and empty. But as I go through the, you know, 200th version of it, I keep saying, oh, I didn't say this. And here's a blank, here's a blank white piece of paper suddenly or well, here's a place I can put it right here. And before you know it, every one of my slides get to look like clutter. Um, so I'm warning you uh, that you're gonna have to put up with it, but you're gonna get to see copies of those slides. Um, I often repeat myself, uh, but I only do it for really important stuff. So when I'm repeating myself, it's because I wanna make a point. And I talk loud and fast, and well, my only excuse is I was brought up in the Bronx, that's it. Okay, let's look at the big picture, which is the time frequency uh, relationships. Uh, this is a modulation and multiple access system. And uh, uh, another part of the, uh, I'm just gonna look at some of the highlights before we actually go into them in detail and tell you what, what's coming. Uh, in order to understand how OFDM uh, can cope in this manner uh, uh, and, and take care of this severe malady, which are the multipath uh, distortion, we have to understand the malady. So the malady was explained to us really almost 60 years ago, two people, Phil Bellow, Paul Green from Lincoln Labs, and there's no better way than to go back to their, uh, what they originally taught us uh, to make sure everybody understands what malady that we're fighting. And I think that for me, the most exciting part of what, of what the magic of OFDM is all about is that it can trick the channel 
How does it trick the channel? It does things. OFDM can accomplish what seems impossible. It rearranges the past and the present. You know why that seems impossible? You have a waveform and you send it off and uh, it's gone once you send it off. How can you grab it back again and make it part of the present? And, 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 and that's what we do. We do what seems impossible. We rearrange the past and the present and the tools we have for doing this are known as the cyclic prefix, which in the process of doing it, it enables us to convert linear convolution to circular convolution, which is part of the magic. So having said all that, I think I, I, I can now emphasize what's about to happen with OFDM uh, coping uh, with, these, uh, with a severe malady distortion. Uh, it can elegantly cope with it, let's say. And um, one, one thing to ask ourselves is if all that we're trying to do is to um, get away, what OFDM allows us to do is to cope with these conditions without using complex equalizing filters. And if that's all that we're trying to do, isn't it reasonable to ask the question, really? I'm going through all this trouble with OFDM technology just so I don't have to invert a matrix. And how difficult is it to equalize a rich multipath channel? In today's world of computational power, it just means that we need to invert a large dimensional matrix. We can do that, right? Well, part of the equalization problem is that we don't have the matrix to invert. We try to form the matrix or its inverse from the raw, noisy, corrupted received signal. And this takes time and undesired overhead. In a wide bandwidth channel, the time to learn the channel and to form the equalizer weights and apply the equalizer process may be longer than the message we're trying to move through the channel. As, and as bandwidth increases, the task becomes much more difficult. Okay. So we've established that this is a tough job uh, and especially for wide band channels, inverting that channel or uh, equalizing it is a tough job. So how does, how does OFDM do it? And the short, let's give you the literary answer would be we're gonna divide and conquer. That's a fancy way of saying we're gonna partition this large bandwidth channel into subchannels. And so um, here's a slide, which I, I call my signature slide because it identifies many of the publications I've had going back to the cover of the IEEE Communications Magazine on August 1983 as the first time this was showed. And it's been on multiple publications, probably 20 or 30. Uh, but finally, this is, and here's a plug for uh, the book that I wrote with Fred Harris, who's in the audience uh, tonight. And um, uh, this is uh, right over here, these little added blocks uh, of uh, OFDM and MIMO at the transmitter and the receiver. You see the same kind of signature uh, picture in our book. I also uh, want to give thank, I want to thank Fred Harris for being the go-to guy uh, uh, who is my friend and colleague for almost 50 years uh, or more and uh, is my mentor and helped me with this presentation. Um, so what you're looking at now suddenly is a, a very urban, uh, this is a, a sky view of uh, an airplane's view of New York City. I love this slide because this is where, this is my city where I grew up as a young boy. And um, uh, I not, notice all the streets. If you're from New York, you'll recognize this. But why am I showing you this? Because the moment I'm talking about multipath events, uh, we're talking about, let's talk about the worst multipath event um, because the, the worst one is terrain dependent. And that's uh, um, uh, frequency selective fading. And it, the terrain matters. Are we in a place where a waveform going off on this channel is gonna hit a lot of uh, obstructions and therefore 
uh, have reflections and and uh, and echoes. Um, uh, well, so the terrain is important to us. You know, the moment you see that, you know, there are other terrains, of course, that would not be so awful in the way of uh, multipath. Uh, you know, like uh, Dorothy said in The Wizard of Oz, uh, she said, this, this doesn't look like Kansas. Anyway, um, one of my favorite researchers and people I admire, uh, Dr. Andrew uh, Viterbi, who founded the Qualcomm Corporation. And way back in 2006, when he uh, acquired the Flareon, uh, which uh, basically was a leading developer of OFDM, I knew from that date on that that was important and I better get to know about what OFDM was. So going back in history, it goes back to as far back as 1957 with a system known as Kineplex. And this was a system where, where bit multiplexing took place on orthogonal carriers. So there is the crux of what OFDM is working with, orthogonal sinusoidal carriers. Um, but notice the thing that Kineplex did not have, and that it, there was not a method for, um, uh, for inverting the channel. It was just a method for sharing the channel. So uh, here's another slide that just sort of emphasizes this partitioning idea. Sharan uh, Langton, uh, who is a very interesting scientist who I admire too, has written a lot on OFDM. And this is these are some of her little uh, sketches, uh, wide band, narrow band. Uh, I think a more telling one is where she has a great big uh, truck carrying a cargo. And clearly, the difficulty there or the downside with one large OFDM truck, like one wide band channel, is that um, if there's an accident, the whole cargo is gone. But if you do your partitioning, which is exactly uh, uh, the analogy here for OFDM, and the, you, divide, you partition up the cargo on many small little cargos, you know, if you suffer an accident on one or two of them, and hopefully there's, a, there's diversity so you can um, get your um, cargo back again. So let's look at the big picture now. We're ready to go to jump into OFDM time frequency relationship, the big picture. This picture was developed by Fred Harris. It's uh, typical of what I think of as a, um, gives you the feeling that OFDM uh, is more than just a multiplex. Uh, it's more than, excuse me, it's more than just a modulation. It's clearly a modulation multiplexing scheme or multiple access uh, scheme where uh, one wide band like this wide band here is going to be partitioned into many uh, subcarriers. Uh, and um, notice you've got time running along this axis um, and, um, and uh, frequency running along this axis where there are the subcarriers. And the big picture is that we do take this wide band uh, uh, channel and we are going to partition it into many narrow uh, bands. Um, and, uh, by the way, a key uh, characteristic uh, of orthogonality is that there must be an integer number of cycles in each uh, subcarrier sinusoid contained in this time interval uh, T sub S, which is the data portion of the OFDM uh, signal. Um, and so when you're looking at a picture uh, like this one over here, you immediately sh it should, it should register that you're looking at a time frequency grid, much like any multiple access system where, uh, you know, just think of a multiple access system where one has to basically raise his hand to ask for service, and then um, uh, someone responds and gives you an assignment. So here are potential assignments. You know, basically 
what you see here is data modulating a carrier by changing its amplitude phase. Uh, it, that's how its modulation takes place here. Uh, and um, uh, what we're uh, so the big picture uh, view it as a multiple access scheme where I have the usual kind of a grid uh, with uh, slots of time and uh, bands of frequencies. And so when I talk about partitioning, you, you see I take this wide band, uh, OFDM wide band bandwidth, and I partition it into multiple uh, carriers. Um, now, we looking down uh, any one of these uh, intervals of time, I would see a superposition of these multiple uh, uh, carriers uh, or in uh, as, as a time domain, I would see multiple sinusoids. And remember, they each have this important characteristic uh, property of orthogonality. Uh, every one of those sinusoids, no matter what the center frequency is, uh, there must be an integer number of cycles in each one of those uh, uh, intervals. Um, why are they called gated? Well, they're turned on and they're turned off. They typically have an envelope. Um, the, the sinusoids have an envelope which is rectangular. And that's why, you know, uh, taking these sinusoids and taking their frequency response will give me sync functions because uh, the, the basic turning on and turning off is a rectangle. So there's a lot going on here that we can uh, let, let's look at this a, little, a lot more carefully. Notice that the data, and the, the data is shown uh, sort of uh, close to this carrier that it's uh, about to modulate. Uh, and the data that I've chosen is typically uh, complex. Uh, so you're going to see a plane, uh, things like Emory uh, PSK or QAM, are the most natural uh, ones to choose here. Uh, basically, an, I, an in phase and quadrature plane. See, there's an axis here, which is the real axis, an axis here, which is the quadrature. You can, so you can see that anytime I'm modulating with a point on this, on this constellation, I'm going to be translating this point uh, or thinking of it as an IQ point. Uh, it is complex point, and it is going to modulate uh, a uh, carrier or a subcarrier. And so this operation is basically um, uh, putting uh, uh, data information, because after all, this is data that you have here, putting data information in the input. When you see a block diagram, I'm going to be putting them into frequency bins. So the input is going to be into a, an IDFT, uh, which accepts frequency and puts out time waveforms. Um, and notice that the number of subcarriers that I have are N sub C uh, subcarriers. Um, let's see, what else do I want to tell you here? Um, another another key characteristic of orthogonality is that um, once I've chosen this T sub S, again, that's the data portion of the OFDM symbol. The OFDM symbol is going to have a data portion and, and a prefix, a cyclic prefix. But it's the data portion that is the heart of this thing. That's the, that's the working end of, of what, what we have here. And another key characteristic of orthogonality is if, if this is an orthogonal signal, then the, the spacing between these tones, uh, which I'm drawing in a way that you can clearly see the, the space as being delta F, but actually the subcarriers are overlapped, which I'm hardly ever going to show them overlap because then it, it isn't very clear to see what's going on. But remember that that when you, in fact, experience them, or if you had the, um, you know, the uh, D to A conversion equipment that will 
uh, turn this uh, into analog uh, outputs, um, you basically um, can can see what we're looking at over here. And and you what would you would see is that the difference between uh, this uh, 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 sync function and this sync function. After all, remember this is frequency. The, the difference in these two frequencies is a delta frequency, which is equal to the reciprocal of uh, this uh, data portion uh, of the uh, grid. Now, if if I find that happens. Is that proof that they are orthogonal? No, and that's why I'm using the word characteristic. Characteristic is like necessary but not sufficient. So where do we begin? How do we start such a multifaceted task? There's so much uh, to get your hands around in, in this technology. So in starting a new OFDM design, we of course need to plan for an integer number of cycles I told you that was an important characteristic of orthogonality. Uh, there's got to be an integer number of cycles in each time interval. Hence, we start by, I, I better know what that, if, if, I, if I'm going to put an integer number of cycles, I better start knowing how many units or what is that time T sub S. So isn't that a good starting point? Uh, choose that T sub S. And do you see that once you've chosen that T sub S, you've immediately chosen that uh, uh, delta F uh, difference uh, between uh, the sync functions um, because um, that's, that's, that's fixed. That's a, a, a necessary condition, but not sufficient to prove orthogonality, but necessary that the, uh, the spacing and frequency between these uh, peaks of the uh, or the center uh, value of the tone of the sync functions uh, are in fact equal to this reciprocal. So, and again, note what is meant by characteristic. It means necessary but not sufficient. And I'll I'll say more about that shortly. So, you know, let's let's break this down immediately to a small set where n sub c is equal to four subcarriers. Uh, and here's my little grid, which is just a shortened version of what you saw before. That is, at every interval of time, I've got uh, subcarriers one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. And you know, and that's what all the literature does is they call these uh, the, the location of the subcarriers or the subcarriers. And I'm going to the trouble. This is my my little hang up, if you like. But I I want to use the words. A potential uh, subcarriers, because after all, um, what whether there's really going to be a subcarrier there depends upon the application. Depends upon this is a multiple access system. Uh, I mean, whether or not somebody is putting somebody is putting data there uh, is uh, a matter of whether there's going to be a uh, a subcarrier there. If there's no one's putting data, then the subcarrier has a zero value. And that's the way I've drawn it here. You know, I've drawn it. Uh, you've got a subcarrier for these uh, n sub c equal four positions for this interval of time. The next interval of time, and the next interval of time, I show them as just dots. You know, as if there were zero uh, values. So again, that's yeah. It's my little uh, nicety or hang up, if you like, to talk about candidate subset subcarriers can go with these fixed positions. Um, and they are fixed once you've determined T sub S. Uh, this is a grid for which the delta F is established. They are, that is fixed. And, and, um, and I, I say, uh, call them candidate uh, subcarriers or potential subcarriers, regardless of what the literature says, you know. Anyway. Examining the spectra of gated sinusoids, having an integer number of cycles. So once I have an interval of time, like call this T sub S, 500 units of time, and uh, let's particularly choose uh, one sinusoidal subcarrier, and remember there has to be an integer number of cycles. So for this one, let's choose three cycles per interval. 
there you go. One, one cycle, two cycles, three cycles. And shown in the frequency domain, uh, you if this is a sinusoid, yeah, and you know it, it, it's a gated sinusoid, so it has an on and an off, and therefore it has this rectangular envelope, and therefore you see it as a sync function uh, with uh, various zeros equally spaced, and there are three cycles per 500 units, or three cycles uh, per C T sub S. Let's, let's just add another uh, tone. Uh, the blue one was the three cycles per 500 units of T sub S. Uh, let's add uh, six cycles. Um, so again, uh, I have uh, two uh, sync functions in the frequency domain, and they're basically uh, located at the point we can call uh, three cycles per interval. That's a, a frequency tone, or and six cycles per interval. But notice what the moment you have chosen T sub S, see the moment you have chosen T sub S, delta F is fixed. So in this particular case, um, the delta F is, you know, 500 units, if, if you like. So when you plot this out, you got uh, a, a sync function, which is three cycles per T sub S or three cycles per uh, uh, T sub S and so on. As you move on uh, to the three cycles and six cycles, let's say, and, and, and just verify that what, what we're looking at the basic um, interval to show that any measurement of delta F uh, is just, let's take an example of three cycles uh, over T sub S uh, minus two cycles over uh, T sub S uh, to get, you know, the one over 500 or one over T sub S is basically check delta F does equal uh, one over T sub S. There are the basic uh, uh, delta Fs, and and there you have it. Uh, I this is adding uh, a, a third one, eight cycles. So I guess what I'm showing you is this is just one particular application. There are going to be many applications. Again, where not every one of these uh, intervals are filled. Hence, I call them potential. Uh, 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 potential tones or potential subcarrier locations at K delta F, where K is any positive or negative uh, integer. I think enough said about that. Um, so a key characteristic is not a proof. There's really only one valid way to test uh, uh, for or to prove orthogonality. Remember, there's no such thing as being orthogonal in only one domain. If a wave, if two waveforms are orthogonal, they're orthogonal in either the time domain or the frequency domain, they are orthogonal. But in my opinion, it's always easiest to view it in the time domain. It's so nice and easy to see. This is, this is the ultimate test, that the inner product of these two tones uh, equals zero. And, you know, this P, you know, so doing this product integration piecewise, this piece times zero is zero, this piece times zero is zero. So indeed, the product integration is zero. Uh, the vector representation is uh, 90 degrees, if you see them as uh, vectors. And, and that's the, the, the sufficient uh, test for orthogonality. L looking at, um, looking again at the characteristics of or orthogonal tones is uh, note that the um, um, and of course closely spaced subcarriers are going to be overlapping and I've, I've separated them just for clarity but they're always going to be overlapping like this uh, and what you're what you're looking at here are is in the frequent this is the frequency domain and you're looking at sync sync functions with the side lobes. And uh, so if the signals are orthogonal, then, um, you, you know, the, the peak uh, 
or the, the nulls of any uh, one particular uh, uh, sink function is going to uh, rest on the peaks of its adjacent values. For instance, uh, uh, a simple, again, way of looking at it. If the spectral sinks are orthogonal, then each subcarrier peak is aligned with the nulls of its candidate neighbors. And this is that, uh, and this is that other quality that we showed you here that will uh, come out. If, if, if this is true, then this will happen. Again, not a proof of orthogonality, but a characteristic of orthogonality. And, and of course, as our, this is just another interesting uh, way of looking at our picture of looking down this way right now in, in this region here is our symbol time. And so looking down the symbol time and seeing it as a multiple access scheme and one application in loading the data, uh, if this is the way the data occurred in serial, uh, that is a QPSK type of modulation where uh, this symbol is sent first and then the minus one, minus one, or the green one uh, second, or the minus one plus one, the yellow one third, or so forth. Well, this is the serial uh, stream of the messages. And the way you, you, you've got one interval of time and you're just loading the subcarrier after subcarrier after subcarrier uh, as they be, as, and they're all available uh, over this period of time, giving you this gated group, uh, each with a fixed uh, integer, with an integer number, with an, not a fixed, but an integer number of cycles. Uh, and so again, this is the way you'd load them. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. And then if you finished up uh, uh, with your first uh, uh, symbol time, you move to the next symbol time and you load the next subcarriers, five, six, seven, and eight, and so on. Okay, now I keep on using this sketch. I've had it for a long time. It's colorful, it's convenient. It acts as my kind of logo, but it's not precise. So if you, uh, each harmonic must display an integer number of cycles during the pulse interval. And you, if you take a look at this carefully, you'll see that that's not true. But yet, uh, uh, I, because I just had it a long time, I don't want to. Uh, I don't want to take the trouble of changing it. I'm still going to go on to use it as a logo. But look at how easy it is for me uh, to actually come up uh, with uh, within this given fixed interval of time T sub s. Uh, call it uh, zero or DC. Then the fundamental would be uh, one cycle within this interval of time, and then two cycles within this same interval of time, and then the third harmonic and the fourth harmonic having four uh, cycles within that interval of time. So I think uh, enough said about that. Um, single carrier versus multi-carrier uh, systems. So, uh, you know, the important thing is if you have one wide band carrier that suffers from multipath distortion and complex equalization is needed to invert this channel. And we already made the point, I don't have to do it again, that um, there is no easy way uh, to take a wide band uh, channel uh, that you first have to learn uh, from, uh, uh, from corrupted uh, data as to what that channel is like and take the time to invert it, it, it is a difficult uh, job. And, uh, and notice uh, that a wideband channel has short symbols, large bandwidth. And, and what is it that we're gonna do? Remember, we're gonna partition that wideband. We're gonna divide and conquer was the fancy way we said it. And, and yet in these little uh, uh, sub-channels or sub-carriers, and now we got long uh, symbols. So uh, notice the, th the thing you can immediately uh, glom onto is that the moment you're gonna partition, 
long symbols is going to be what we're looking for. Um, so what you see here uh, is a conventional multi-channel uh, OFDM, uh, a conventional multi-channel system here, uh, such as uh, AM and AF, AM and FM radio is a good example. And boy, is that a, a waste of uh, a frequency uh, when you've got to have, you know, guard bands between typical AM and FM uh, radios. And what we're going to be doing uh, in OFDM is we're going to have, we're going to have a 50% overlap. And that is the, the minimum distance that you can get with these things are 50% overlap. You, you, you cannot overlap it more than 50%. Um, and so that uh, overlap of adjacent channels is what um, is going to get us to, you know, twice the benefit that we get to kind of use the bandwidth uh, twice, if you like. Um, so um, now what this slide is all about called maximizing bandwidth uh, utilization uh, has to do with lightening the signaling space. We're sort of taking an aside for a moment of, of just, I want to tell you something about history. And that is, you know that the idea of bandwidth utilization uh, is a waste. Uh, and nobody wants, bandwidth is expensive uh, these days. And Oh, we want to be very um, uh, uh, careful in how we utilize bandwidth, and we want to utilize it without any uh, spaces. We want to lighten uh, the signaling space, uh, so to speak. Uh, and so, uh, in and and just let me show you in that historically, uh, uh, in that if I had very low, um, the bandwidth could have regions containing little or no signal energy, and the capacity would be reduced by a factor. I don't want that. I want to whiten the signaling space, to have a, a, a flat bandwidth, uh, uh, so to speak, in the signaling space. And notice that in history, in 1995, European countries began to replace analog FM did you know that analog FM radio transmission is very wasteful? Because if you look at the PDF, the power density distribution of uh, in, in the frequency domain, it, it has a triangular uh, uh, shape. It, it basically is very uh, wasteful of uh, bandwidth. And so notice that uh, in 1995, the countries already replaced OFDM with uh, OFDM type systems, um, digital audio broadcasting is an OFDM type system. By, by 2017, most all of Europe and Australia had converted DAB, digital audio broadcasting, replaced the bandwidth inefficient FM with digital OFDM uh, signaling. Okay, number one, the Fourier transform of a rectangular window gated sinusoid is a sink function spectrum. Gated sinusoid, there's a rectangle. That's what you have with equally spaced, equally spaced zeros. That's what you're looking at. What about the Fourier transform of a superposition of many gated uh, sinusoids, at, at like looking down a superposition of many gated ones? Well, you're going to have uh, just multiple uh, sink functions. Again, here are the uh, zeros. Uh, here are the, the nulls that you see. Uh, the peaks of these sync functions correspond to uh, neighboring uh, nulls. Um, and we've seen, we've talked about this before. This is just a repeat slide. And, but remember, this is what we are, uh, th this is really the proof of the, and, and is sufficient uh, to show that they're orthogonal. The other we're calling uh, characteristics uh, of orthogonal signaling. Um, so sinusoids are truly amazing.
sorry about that. Uh, the truly amazing, and, and OFDM's main function is to manipulate orthogonal sinusoids. Why is it useful? Because they are amazing. There's no distortion. We talked about this already. So uh, remember, to say a sinusoid plus its echoes is an undistorted sinusoid. I don't have to repeat that again. This was the more precise way of saying it. Steady state sinusoids plus its channel induced echoes into any linear time invariant system yields an undistorted sinusoid at the output. So notice that long pulses are the key to OFDM. The moment I, um, I, I basically uh, transform from uh, uh, the from the wide band to the narrow band, where the signals uh, in the frequency domain are now overlap. This is uh, one of the few times you'll see me overlapping them. Um, and remember, what we get are lengthened, uh, uh, lengthened uh, uh, symbols, and the length of the pulses is proportional to the uh, number of uh, subcarriers, and that's why you see n sub c. Uh, uh, written there, or I'll call it the number of potential or candidate uh, signals. Um, so we better understand uh, what this uh, malady is all about, these uh, key WISIS functions, which stands for wide sensationary uncorrelated scatterers. This is what we're fighting. This is what OFDM is, is going to handle so nicely. And, and this is the information that was given to us. This is from Proakis's uh, uh, book uh, in 19, um, I forget when uh, this book was, but the people who came up with this in 1962 and 1963, uh, Phil Bellow and Paul Green, uh, and this is basically the way uh, they uh, described it. Uh, this is the channel uh, characteristics. Um, and so, the, the power density fun, uh, spectra and the correlation functions of the channel. And so what you see here, number one, is, is known as the multipath intensity profile, showing you the received signal S of delay as a function of delay time, where what is plotted here is the main lobe plus the delayed echoes. That sort of exponential uh, shape to it is a very uh, typical operation uh, that you're going to see uh, in nature. Um, and then if you take the Fourier transform of that, um, what you see here is known as the spaced frequency correlation function. And what that, that is really giving you is something called a coherence bandwidth. It's telling you the region of consistency, that is, um, uh, of these of, of delta, this is plotted versus delta frequency. Remember how you do this. You, this is a correlation function. You basically take two tones that are spaced delta f apart, and you uh, uh, take a, uh, a cross correlation of the two of them, and you come up with a value, and then you increase that delta f, and you do it all over again and you get another value, and then you do it all over again. And what you're plotting here is basically uh, the response, the correlation as a function of spaced frequency. And therefore, what you come up with, therefore, uh, this region right here, which is known as F sub zero, known as the coherence bandwidth, is the, the spectral region that is going to be uh, relatively con uh, it's constant behavior, constant, constant tr treatment in going through this channel. Remember, this is not your equipment. This is the channel behavior as your signal flies through it, but you don't see your signal right here. This is just the channel behavior. And this is known as the space-time correlation function. Again, uh, you are taking uh, correlatives of, uh, of uh, individual um, uh, time uh, samples uh, and making uh, the delta time between those samples larger and larger and larger. And as you take those cross correlates uh, and, and plot them out as a function of time, 
you've got a region which is giving you a coherence time, a region over which uh, the, the channel uh, is, uh, is operating in a relatively consistent uh, fashion. And, and if you take the Fourier transform of that, uh, you've basically got the Doppler uh, power uh, spectrum, which you can also call the fading uh, rate uh, F sub D. Why is this model suitable for all time and for all frequency? And the answer is nothing here is plotted in, term, in terms of time um, or in versus time or versus frequency. The parameters are time delay or change in time or Doppler frequency or change in frequency. Notice, uh, oh, remember everything on the right-hand side are basically terrain dependent and is multiply spread. And everything on the left-hand side is velocity dependent and is basically um, uh, dependent, uh, uh, I call it fading rapidity or spectral dispersion. Here it's signal dispersion, here it's spectral dispersion. I think that the right-hand side here is the fading profile and the, and the left-hand uh, 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 column here is showing you the channel behavior when something is changing. I mean, it may not be you, you may be standing still, but uh, the receiver uh, might be moving or maybe it's the atmosphere that's, uh, uh, that's, that's changing. Uh, but typically, uh, something is changing, and this is the rate uh, of uh, changing. And again, uh, uh, spectral correlation, uh, time correlation, time spreading, spectral uh, spreading. And so, um, lots of uh, descriptions here. Uh, uh, we've already said this. This is the multipath intensity profile. It shows the signals received, average power, it's main lobe and its side lobe as a function of time delay. Uh, and, and T sub M is always showing you the maximum amount of uh, lobes, of fingers of return that you're going to be receiving, the maximum uh, spreading. And, and similarly, in number two, uh, the uh, spaced uh, frequency uh, correlation function shows the spectral correlation of received narrowband signals spaced delta F apart to be measured by transmitting a pair of sinusoids separated by delta F, cross-correlating and repeating that multiple times while increasing delta F. And, and what you're getting as a result of that is uh, this uh, distance gives rise to what we'll call an F sub zero, a coherence bandwidth, the spectral range over which the channel behaves coherently. I mean, coherently typically means fading or not fading. Uh, if, and outside of this region, it's behaving quite independently. You got, you know, or randomly, if you like. So the positioning of such a, oh, I'm not going to go on here. That's it. I, I think enough. And the same sort of thing to describe what we mean by the coherence time and the, and the its Fourier transform is the Doppler uh, power, uh, Doppler power density. The effects of the multipath channel, and this is what you're really interested in, how does the channel behave when my signal comes along? And this is where we have, uh, and remember the numbers one, two, three, four, are basically what we have given to you as the as the uh, multipath spread, the space frequency correlation function, the space time correlation function, and the fading bandwidth uh, that describes the way uh, the channel is, has classically been described in terms of these fading profiles and velocity dependent uh, 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 aspects, fading rapidity. And notice that I have a boundary. And the boundary, first of all, the first thing to note here is the note up here. Note that there's no good operating regions. The possibilities are either bad or awful. Those are our choices. Take it or leave it. And, 
So what you see here is that on one side of this boundary, I can either have this awful frequency selective uh, fading, uh, same thing here on this side of the boundary, awful frequency selective fading, uh, and uh, below this uh, boundary, uh, with with this in mind, I'm going to have uh, flat fading, uh, flat fading, or uh, in talking about spectral dispersion or the fading rapidity aspect, where the, uh, I'm interested in the rate of change, uh, it's either fast fading is awful or the mealy bad uh, is slow fading. Uh, so uh, notice how uh, what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be taking uh, one region. Of, let's take the terrain region where where when things are awful, that's what I get. What is known as frequency selective uh, fading, uh, and uh, and 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 when things are you know merely bad, uh, then it's uh, flat fading. Uh, so again, here's a good example of received power as a, a function of uh, delay time. And, and that's a good example of a frequency selective fading where uh, uh, the amount, uh, the maximum spread T sub M, and here it is, is greater uh, than the symbol time. Well, let's take an example. Here goes symbol number one. Uh, and remember, uh, symbol not, here is the symbol time, T sub S. And remember what this fading profile is doing. It's causing echoes. And, and what is the maximum number of echoes it's going to have? Uh, uh, T sub M. So I've, what is T sub M? T sub M is the case where I send off the first symbol and I have an echo, an echo, an echo, an echo, an echo. So I always, every time I'm sending a symbol, I got five echoes. So here is symbol one, and I got echoes uh, one through five, and that's over here. Okay, now I send uh, the second symbol, which is the blue symbol. Uh, and, uh, and it has an echo, an echo, an echo, an echo, and an echo here. Then I send the lavender symbol, and, and it, it takes me out here, and the brown, and the green, and, and the yellow. So every time I'm sending a symbol, I don't just get the symbol uh, uh, transmitted, uh, but in going, this is the way the channel is behaving. This is what this uh, particular channel, this awful channel, is doing to my transmitted uh, symbol. Uh, it's sending each one of them off with six copies. So if I take a, a look at, at this uh, arriving signals, I clearly see uh, that I have intersymbol interference uh, uh, be, uh, uh, amongst uh, uh, six different uh, symbols that were sent. That is awful. So, so when I take that awful case, where the case of T sub M, uh, the amount of delay spread, which was much greater or was greater than the symbol time. And I take its Fourier uh, transform. Uh, uh, let me just remind you of uh, what I'm doing here. So I, I'm taking a situation like this, you know, and I'm, I'm uh, excuse me, and, and, and looking back at its Fourier transform over here to see where the what does it look like in this uh, in this uh, co in this coherence uh, bandwidth picture, and and this is what it looks like. This is what makes it look awful because this is the coherence bandwidth here. You know, this is the region of the channel uh, that is um, operating in a uh, in a pretty consistent way. Um, you know, according, remember, this is what has been given to us by Paul Green and Phil Bellow. And, and, and if your signal falls outside of this coherence bandwidth, it's going to behave quite independently. And so when you take the Fourier transform of this awful situation where uh, T sub M is so much larger than T sub S, what you're basically 
uh, seeing is that the bandwidth uh, of your signal is much greater uh, than the the portion known as the coherence bandwidth. And you know you would cer and certainly this is what you got. You got regions here that are going to be of your signal that are going to be operating pretty independently, and that's where the uh, distortion uh, comes from. And similarly, even when you take a look at the bad, at the simply simply bad side of the uh, boundary, where uh, uh, this is T sub M uh, is the end of the um, uh, echo rampage, uh, but not, uh, but this is the end of the symbol here. So the uh, maximum uh, spreading is less than the symbol duration, and and its Fourier transform puts puts your signal bandwidth within the consistent uh, portion of the coherence band. Hurrah! Uh, you're doing great. I mean, you're doing as good as you can in this case, merely uh, flat fading. Um, and so when you move over to this side, remember this is where you're looking at the fading rapidity. Something's changing. Uh, the rate of the uh, is changing. Uh, so uh, it's going to be either fast fading or slow fading. And again, um, if you uh, take a look at the awful side of the boundary, uh, fast fading, it turns out uh, that uh, the that's where the uh, symbol time uh, is greater uh, than the coherent bandwidth. Uh, and I can see this is a Fourier transform pair and the Remember, there's this unusual ball shape when um, what, what I had drawn before is simply a blob called uh, uh, the fading bandwidth. If you, if you go back, you see this blob that I had uh, for the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, fading as a function of Doppler uh, bandwidth. Uh, well, uh, it turns out that if you take a look at a model of mobile communications, a model known as the dense scatter channel model gives rise to a different shape than just that blob here. Uh, and so I'm showing you the actual Doppler power spectrum shape that you're going to see. And, and again, you, you, you don't want the fading bandwidth uh, to exceed the bandwidth of your signal because that's horrible. This is a horrible case. The fading bandwidth is faster uh, than the bandwidth of you, than the uh, bandwidth of your signal. And what that means is that your signal is going to be mutilating. If you look at the spaceband uh, signal, it's going to go in and out of being there, and that is what we call the fast fading. And say so the Fourier transform of that happening uh, within this uh, coherence time where you would dearly love it to be merely bad, uh, but it exceeds the coherence uh, time. And that you don't want that because out here is where signals are working quite independently. Uh, and so look at the slow fading, which is merely being on the bad side of the boundary, where indeed the fading rate, uh, which is uh, this region uh, right here, this width right here uh, is going to be less uh, than uh, the uh, uh, the bandwidth of your uh, signal, and that puts the symbol time uh, well within the coherence uh, time, um, and and that gives rise to what is often seen uh, as a channel gain versus these dual functions, F sub zero and T sub zero. So again, this is a transfer function of a multipath channel where you're seeing uh, time along this axis and frequency along this axis. Uh, and notice what I call this, I call this my metaphoric a black cloud because it's almost like uh, if, if you are a vehicle or just a user, never mind a vehicle, just a receiver uh, that's 
um, yeah, for which uh, this is the way your uh, channel, remember uh, F sub zero and T sub zero, these are uh, channel uh, 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 parameters. And this is the terrain dependent, and this is a channel parameter, but if there's no movement, uh, there is, you know, if there's no movement, then T sub zero is an infinite. So uh, it is, uh, uh, even though it's a channel uh, uh, parameter, it's dependent on whatever is moving in that, uh, uh, in that uh, signal uh, dispersion. And uh, it typically is your automobile uh, uh, that, that is moving. So again, it, it's a kind of a metaphor that there's always a cloud uh, over your head. So again, this here is uh, terrain dependent. It's the range of the channel spectral consistency based on the terrain. And this here is velocity dependent uh, based on the range of channel time consistency based on the vehicle, typically on the vehicle velocity. It could be other movement. So if there is no motion, I, I told you that this is infinity. Um, I, I think I've said everything here, coherence bandwidth F sub zero represents a co consistent spectral region where the channel behaves coherently, typically fading or non-coherent. Coherence time is again a consistent time duration during which the channel behaves coherently, velocity dependent. And so um, OFDM transforms a frequency and time variable fading channel into, think of them as parallel correlated flat fading channels, eliminating the need for complex equalization. That's, that's why we can say it does it elegantly, doing away with complex, because it's like taking a slice uh, through here. And what's, instead of having this uh, huge uh, bandwidth uh, to invert, which we already made the point that that is a tough job, uh, what you've got here typically shows you that each little slice can be viewed as something uh, approximately flat, which can be uh, uh, fixed by just a scaling factor in the frequency uh, domain. So why OFDM again? Remember, we, uh, we have this why, if, if this happens, if this happens to be our uh, coherence uh, bandwidth, remember, uh, that's a channel thing. And our signal bandwidth is much greater than the channel bandwidth. Oh, we want to, we want to start partitioning and, and mitigation here. This arrow says, hey, I want to move from wideband to this partitioning uh, mitigation. And notice that, and, and, and typically I want to um, avoid both uh, frequency selective and, uh, uh, fl and flat fading. Uh, but let's, in fact, as I partition it, draw a line and saying that if I were just talking in general, I'm saying that I, if this is my symbol, I want my symbol rate, which is one over T sub S, or call this my bandwidth, if you like, my signal bandwidth, uh, to be well within this coherence bandwidth. And also, I don't want the fading rate uh, to chop me up and mutilate me, so I want my signaling rate to be greater than the fading rate. So, but even if I, uh, looking at OFDM, which is the partition case, so remember, instead of a one over T sub S, you can think of having uh, this whole W bandwidth signal, which is basically the whole uh, shebang of available bandwidth that I'm using, which is pretty much divided by uh, the permissible or allowable uh, N sub C signal points. And remember, once we establish our little grid, we've established how many subcarriers there potentially are. Uh, and so uh, that's uh, the uh, symbol rate for OFDM. And 
the same sort of thing. So, um, and again, notice that the entire bandwidth is going to be uh, those N sub C um, available bandwidth uh, points uh, times the spacing delta F that gives me the uh, total uh, signal bandwidth. I'm not showing you that 50% overlap here, uh, but there's all, it's always there. And so um, that's, that's what I've summarized here, that N sub C represents the number of potential or candidate subcarriers with locations K delta F, where K is any positive or negative integer. And here is my well, wish list. Uh, and my wish list is so that my, um, uh, what I told you, I want this, these inequalities uh, to uh, prevail, uh, which will uh, satisfy me being avoiding frequency uh, selective fading and this uh, uh, to prevail when I basically want my uh, uh, want my signaling to be uh, larger than the uh, fading rate. So remember that our wish list has two inequalities. Left hand side wants the off DM symbol rate to be less than the channel coherence bandwidth to preclude frequency selective fading. Right hand side wants the symbol rate to be larger than the channel rate to preclude uh, fast fading or, or simple uh, mutilation. So again, uh, this side frequency will help frequency selective, this side uh, fast uh, fading. And of course, uh, equalization of such channels is accomplished with a, a simple scaling in the frequency delay domain. I know that it, fit, it fits nicely uh, into our assumed MIMO channel model, narrow band flat fading channels receive phases as can be described with complex uh, uh, valued gain factors. That's nice too. Equalization inversion is difficult here and here the benefit uh, low rate sub channels makes scaling easy. OFDM implementation examples. Okay, so remember, what is OFDM? First of all, notice, th this is important to notice. When I talk about uh, DFT and the inverse DFT, those are processes. Uh, this is an IDFT that is a process. You put endpoints in, you get endpoints out. Uh, you put uh, five, point, five uh, values in, you get five values out. Uh, it's a process. But notice that FFT and IFFT represents algorithms. Algorithms uh, are not hardware. They're not uh, processes. They are basically uh, techniques uh, that uh, do things uh, uh, cleverly, quickly. FFT is a mighty uh, nifty process for uh, doing this kind of uh, transformation that we would require out of the IDFT. So notice these words right here. That, and, 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 and what you're looking at is a very simple, you know, uh, input and output uh, with uh, points in equaling points out and a modulator multiplier for every one of these to produce this. So you, you don't see any FFT niceness here. So without FFT technology, each output wire will output a sinusoidal time waveform, which is basically the Fourier transform of the phasor on its paired input wire. And notice that thanks to FFT operation, each wire of the IDFT is not going to behave that way. It is not going to be, it's not going to give you uh, the user of OFDM, which of course is using this FFT magnificence. It's going to give you, it, 
every one of these wires is going to give you the same superposition of these gated sinusoids, but each wire will give you a, success, a successive moment in time of that superposition. So once you use FFT, once you've gone through the FFT process, there's no way to go back and get those individual time waveforms. You're only working with a superposition and each one gives you a moment in time. So uh, if you take a look uh, and, and notice, I told you one of my problems is I, my slides get busier and busier. This got horrible. So I'm gonna, you're gonna have a set of these slides to look at. You can look at it on your own. But let me tell you what we, what we want and what this computation gives you. So we want the channel delay spread to be much smaller than T sub S. And I want to examine this without OFDM and with OFDM. So without OFDM, I go through a particular case of, of having, you know, a particular uh, bits per second going through rate one half uh, coding and then through an ADRI PSK and then coming out uh, with a, a symbol and a particular symbol time. And in this particular example, uh, the channel uh, delay spread was given to you as three microseconds, which I can also now uh, that I can tell you what T sub S is, is three and a half microseconds, say that the channel delay spread is given to, to you as uh, two symbol times. And say, so that's what you're looking at right here. You're saying without OFDM, the channel delay spread comes along and does something like this. It kind of wipes out two symbols, so to speak, immediately. But with OFDM, when you're, you're using these FFT uh, properties, with OFDM, the symbol is gonna be 65 times longer. It's going to give you uh, a, uh, uh, an OFDM time of 96 microseconds. And with that much longer symbol time, and that's what we're going for, long symbols uh, is going to be uh, part of the magic of our OFDM, then the what is the channel uh, uh, spreading, this is the channel behavior that we went into this uh, system with, is only a small percentage of, of this uh, total time. So again, uh, Without OFDM, uh, you get uh, basically uh, a, a small uh, wipeout. And uh, with OFDM, lengthening the symbol time basically mitigates the channel smearing. The effect of channel-induced ISI is small when there is OFDM. Look at the details on, on your own. Now, um, when you saw me talk about coherence bandwidth of nine of, uh, I, I, I didn't actually talk about this, but notice when you saw me talk about coherence bandwidth, and remember a rule of thumb uh, is that it's approximately uh, the, the reciprocal of the maximum multipath spread. That's its rule of thumb. But if you want to be a little bit more precise, uh, what is often called out is a coherence bandwidth, not 90% coherence bandwidth or a 50% coherence bandwidth. And so notice what that uh, alludes to. So it alludes to that frequency over which the channel's frequency transfer function has a correlation of at least 0.9. So we're talking about the amplitude of this, uh, remember uh, what R of delta F was, it was that, uh, uh, it was that uh, spaced frequency correlation function. It, it's the amplitude of this. Or the, if you talk about the 50% the 50 coherence bandwidth, you're talking about the frequency interval over which the channel's frequency transfer function has a correlation of at least 0.5. So as an example, you know, 90% uh, would be, you know, here's the blob I used for 
frequency correlation function. And when I said is what it gives you is this F sub, F sub zero coherence bandwidth where rule of thumb is uh, that coherence bandwidth, that region of consistency uh, is just one over T sub M. But if you want to call it out, somewhat more consistently as is done in our business. The 90% would be, you know, if, if, if this is like uh, where uh, correlation is unity up here, this would be, let's say the 90% point, this would be the 50% point. And, and you see that it's region, you know, it, it's a much narrower uh, uh, frequency domain region uh, that you know, we can talk about as the F sub zero uh, there, or a much, uh, it's a little bit wider here at the 50% point, which is less rigid than the 90%. And that's all this goes on to tell you uh, as well. Okay, now we're getting to trick the channel. This is the part that is the magic, the importance of the cyclic prefix. We're getting into the magic of this thing. Plotting periodic outputs of a unit circle, tricking the channel by converting linear uh, convolution to circular. Nothing in nature prepares us for this trick. How can we connect the front of a launch signal to its back end? How, we, how can we go up and gra grab it? So this is one of his OFDM properties, which I think of as elegant. So here is us coming along, uh, no OFDM, and what you have is symbol after symbol after symbol. Think of them as sending little impulses here and the channel behavior is uh, a multi-path uh, spread that looks like a horrible uh, situation. And once I do have OFDM and I have a lengthened symbol, uh, notice that lengthened uh, symbols uh, gives us the ability uh, to uh, get much better effect. And so notice what I have. I have symbol after symbol after symbol, the lengthened uh, symbol. And I, I have discontinuities. Uh, these are all discontinuity points that you have here. So notice the fact that there's going to be uh, this uh, problem uh, at the discontinuity said, I can fix that. And the way that you fix the inner symbol interference that having close uh, T sub S uh, symbols is you put a space there and you just fixed it. I just fixed ISI. That's all it takes is a space. I fixed it. Uh, well, I, I do something further. And this is where the clever part comes in because fixing ISI is not enough because remember what I have uh, uh, in that bank of uh, subcarriers, I can have intercarrier interference, uh, and I got to fix that too. And notice the clever way I do it. Uh, I, I basically uh, take the back end uh, of the symbol, and I move it up uh, uh, front here, and I call that the cyclic, and I fill in this blank space that was just there to fix the ISA, and and I and I let that cyclic prefix absorb what is going to be uh, the uh, uh, disordered portion for me. Now I'm getting close to telling you the real magic. So I'm, and this is where linear convolution gets uh, close to circular convolution. So even if we're getting close to the end, I got to give you this one uh, uh, slide. Uh, notice that um, the back end of the appended cyclic pre pre prefix is continuous with the front end of the OFDM symbol because there's an integer number of cycles per gated sinusoid. So do you see that this back end right here, this back end is continuous with this front end? So uh, notice this. Uh, once I, I take this back end and I move it up to the front end, this is a continuous edge right here. So notice what I have here. The end of the cycle at the back end is here. The start of the cycle with the front end is here. That's the 
old transmit. Uh, now I have a continuous edge. This is the transient of the new front edge. So notice during convolution, as the channel impulse response slides from the cyclic uh, prefix into the signal uh, interval, see as it slides into this, uh, it has the appearance of leaving the signal's uh, back end, um, uh, uh, leaving the signal's back end while entering the front end without any discontinuities. Thus, linear convolution appears to be circular. This is the truth. And notice my, my little statement here. If you remember only one slide from this briefing, let it be this one. This is the magic of when we say that OFDM, by uh, manipulating sinusoids as its main function, is doing something that we think of as impossible. It's, it's rearranging, it's moving the discontinuities. Uh, and so here you have, you know, the, the cyclic prefix, this cyclic prefix end matches the signal front over here. And, uh, and this is a continuous edge. And what had been uh, discontinuities uh, uh, has been moved uh, to, to a, a new spot. And that's right over here. Uh, and you know something, uh, and that doesn't bother us because we're gonna be throwing this away uh, at the receiver. But this is, uh, so uh, there will no longer be a transient at the original times signals starting edge. No longer will there be a transient here. This is going to be a continuous edge. The transient now resides at the new starting edge of the cyclic prefix, which will be tossed. So there's going to be an integer number of cycles per symbol. These are all uh, uh, necessary characters. These are all characteristics uh, of uh, orthogonality. Integer number of cycles, back end of the cyclic prefix equals the front end of the symbol. The continuous edge between the added cyclic prefix and the old starting edge and the transient at the new starting edge. So. Now, Bernie, Bernie, yeah, this is Victor. How are you doing? Um, yeah, so I know you told me to sort of check in on you on the time. I think um, this may be a good logical breakpoint. Okay. Maybe for the next uh, session, part two next week, you can pick it up from here. I know this is about half of your presentation. Okay. So, so I think I, I think if that's okay with you. Uh, yeah. It we, is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we, we, we did most of it because I wanted to go through. This is where I uh, hope to go through, but, but I didn't. So let's remember that um, we'll just start uh, our next uh, week's session on the 25th uh, at this same time uh, with this periodic in outputs on a unit circle, uh, which of course is going to allow us allow us to plot the start and finish on a unit circle and we will be able to um, uh, uh, say an awful lot about the magic that this one slide that I dry, that I'm glad I got to present today uh, mm -hmm. covers. So um, are there is there time for questions and answers? Uh, uh, yes, yeah. yes. Yeah, I think uh, it's getting kind of late on the East Coast, but um, you know we still have ten minutes for Q and A. If people have any questions, uh, I guess we can uh, unmute the uh, participants if they want to uh, you know, speak up, ask their questions, or they can, or you can type in your questions into the Q and A box and I'll read it. Okay. Or, yeah. yeah but thank you. Vic, uh, Victor, it might be better if they type into the Q and A, just because we've got about seventy five people on the call, and I'm not sure if I can. What okay. happens if I do an unmute all? Okay. Okay. Nope. Sorry, yeah, you should be. You should see a Q and A window, and uh, as they come in, Victor, if you can't see them, I'll make sure that I assign uh -huh. them to you, and then you yeah. should be able to see them. Well, okay. let, let, 
let, let me at least do this. Uh, on okay. these uh, slides, uh, sure. remember uh, that if we go back to my very first slide, uh, everybody see my email address. Um, I, you know, I'm, I'm in the habit of receiving uh, emails. I love to receive them and answer them. So um, uh, just send me an email. And, and if you put your question in writing, I'll be glad to answer it. And if it has general interest, we'll take it up uh, next week as well. Um, so uh, I think that that might be a good uh, response to the Q and A. Yeah, yeah this is great. Uh, thank you for doing that, uh, Ms. Galar. And uh, yeah, I already posed some questions to uh, like the Galar about the OFDM. It's a little bit more advanced than ABC is. What uh, what are the differences in OFDM and five G? Uh, there are some modifications in the uh, OFDM curriculum from LTE to five G. It'd be interesting to understand why they have to do that. So, um, and then uh, let's see, we do have some questions on the chat box. I think we answered them already about getting your presentation. Uh, yeah, so people can download them from the uh, the link that we provided into the Q and A. Um, but uh, I don't see any other questions at this point. Um, uh, well, let me uh, maybe Paul uh, ask a few questions uh, on my own. I guess I, I sort of curious about like, um, the application of OFDM for satellite communications. What are your thoughts on, uh, on that? So I think we can stop sharing this now and we can uh, go back to uh, uh, talk about uh, next week if we like uh, mm -hmm. uh, the um... okay somebody maybe type just type in something uh i guess say thank you Will a new web link be sent in part two next week so there is already a new link already um that's you should be able to register for it now. If you again follow the website, um, I mean, follow the link in the, in the box, okay. it will also take you to the uh, registration link for next, next okay. week's Okay, so just, I'll, mm -hmm. I'll just save what you sent me and I'll uh, use it for getting on uh, uh, next week at the same time. Yes. yes. Okay, thank you. Sure, thank you very much. Um, yeah, so I think that's good. Thank you all for participating. And, uh, you know, this is a very good uh, uh, introduction to OFDM. You know, help us understand why this is such a problem for me. So uh, thanks, thanks again. Uh, okay. Thank you for everybody for dialing in. We hope to see you next week. All right. Okay. All right. See you. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye-bye.